Welcome to this podcast review for August 13th, 2024, and I'm Jaded Duran. And I'm Brendan Cassidy. Hey, thanks for joining us, everybody, for this conversation. Let's go ahead and jump right to it, Brendan. The question that everyone is here to listen for. Mm-hmm. Brendan, are you cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs? That's what everyone wants to know. <laughs> I will say I think that question's more interesting than the movie itself that we're about to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> wow, oh, you took okay. you took me back. You took me back. That is that is nostalgia and a half right there. Cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. Oh my yeah. goodness. <laughs> That's what everyone wants to know. Are we cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs? And the answer might be yes. I was when I was a kid. Yeah. Uh, admittedly, I kind of gotten away from Cereals like that as I've gotten older, I gravitated Same. more towards yeah. Special K and things like that. Yeah, I don't really do cereal all that much generally, but if I do, it is along those lines these days. Oh, yeah. Like when I was a I kid, will... it was, yeah, it was Cocoa Puffs, Cocoa Pebbles, Reese's Puffs. It was all of yeah. those. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I will say every now and then, it doesn't happen a lot, but every now and then, thanks to my children, I will indulge in a little CTC. I still love okay. a little CTC. You like a little CTC? Okay, that's an interesting yeah. one. It's a very yeah. interesting one. I don't hear that one very often. No, you don't yeah. like at least not here. Some, yeah. You don't like some cinnamon toast crunch? Uh, I I never did, and maybe that's the thing. It was never really a staple in my household. Uh, that was a little bit. That was a little too sweet for me. Um, but okay. admittedly, I was I was someone that never had much of a sweet tooth and still don't have much of a sweet tooth. My idea yeah, I generally of, don't either. Yeah. yeah, but my idea of snacking was more more salty kind of cravings. Yeah. Like I would go for a bag of chips or beef jerky Same. over yeah, any type of chocolate. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. generally how I am as well. Yeah. My yeah. biggest what I'm cuckoo for the most when it comes to sweets is like homemade brownies that have like the caramel in the middle. Okay. Those I will eat until I die. Like I'll oh, just I, have I'll a heart take something attack like on that. the spot. Yeah. Well, when the texture is a bit more, I guess, fudgy like that. Yes. If, yeah. yeah. Like I, I enjoy a good yeah. donut, especially. Yeah. Um, so it's like, like, I guess if it's more bread focused, I'll probably go for it then. I don't yeah. know. You um, and I totally, totally align that. In fact, all right, well, let's donuts. Let's go, let's go get snacks together. <laughs> <laughs> and I love how we're going down this rabbit hole. Hey, you asked me if I was cuckoo movie. for Cocoa Puffs. You yeah. started this. <laughs> I did. And maybe I am stalling here a little bit. That could be purposeful. Who knows? We'll get to cuckoo here in just a moment. But since we're here, donuts have been ruined for me. And it's interesting how your childhood and nostalgia could be blinders when it comes to things like this. You know, we've talked about this with movies as well. I think food is equally in the conversation because Mm -hmm. there is a local donut shop in my hometown that is a one of one. It is the only one that exists. It is not a chain it is a sing it is owned by a family and it is a single shop. Okay. So it is as local as local can possibly get. And okay. it is the best donuts I have ever had in my life. <laughs> and nothing has ever come close. Especially your big chains like your Dunkin' Donuts and things like that. Get I can't that I can't out really of my do face. Those. I can't really do those anyway. I'm I'm with you yeah. in, in a way. There's there's a local place right near me that's it's partially local there are a few locations it's called the happy mixer but my wife and i go there because she she eats gluten-free and they actually make gluten-free products it's a gluten-free bakery and it's a very different kind of texture and a very different kind of taste that i've learned to really love it's more it's just it's more authentic in a weird way uh yeah i just when when you find that local sort of thing it it just makes it better it just makes it better it's the best shout out to john's donuts Back in Bryan, Ohio. Absolutely mm-hmm. love it. In fact, 
the the last time I had it, my mom and my sister were co- were coming down last year to go on vacation with us. Okay. And they were driving down, so it was going to take about 24 hours for, for them to get here. <laughs> I still asked for them you. <laughs> to bring me donuts. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Even though they were going to be a day old, I was like, I'd rather have the day old Johns than... Like I just, I just need it back in my life. And I can only it was imagine glorious. that's probably better than you know even a freshly baked Dunkin' donut. Oh, uh, like yeah, get that nonsense out of here. No, no, no. I just, yeah, donuts have been ruined for me. But if there was a John's around here, I would eat there maybe every day. Like their donuts are that good. <laughs> like, so basically, John's best. is the coffee cult of donuts yeah it is the coffee call to the great <laughs> transition to this week's spots uh yeah no, yeah it's it's the coffee yeah because there's only one coffee call location yeah so yeah there you that's go. a great there you go. great uh analogy there uh at any rate uh we're here to talk about cuckoo it is which has nothing to do film. with sweet it's not a sweet film <laughs> no, it's not. uh a horror film from tillman singer um, you know, like I don't want to be critical, overly critical of the film because Neon was very nice to us. They put us in the trailer for Cuckoo. I'm yeah. very grateful for that. That was great. One of Love my that. favorite experiences of the year so far, seeing that yeah. in a crowded theater before Trap. Um, so I'm not here to completely dismiss cuckoo i don't want that to be the case as as always brendan and i will have an open-minded conversation yeah on cuckoo so if you're a fan yeah. of the film don't worry we're we're here to be cordial we um, are and right. and i feel like i may have <laughs> played too much of a cynical card too early when i said cuckoo for cocoa puffs might be more interesting than the movie we're about to talk about um but to be fair cuckoo for cocoa puffs that sounds more interesting than a lot of movies that we yeah. get nowadays so that it's maybe be. less of a reflection of cuckoo more of a reflection yeah. of hollywood i guess yeah um but but yeah you make a good point um we were very happily featured in session film is very happily featured yeah. in the marketing for cuckoo uh really love the review that writer serena uh did for this one yeah um and yeah. we may reference a few things that was that was in that written review but it's a movie that's dividing some people some people are going for it some people aren't and we'll offer our perspectives yeah. here and how we feel about it exactly yeah i've seen reviews that are completely raving about this film that absolutely yeah. love it so, yeah, there it certainly has its fans. There's not out about mm. it. All right, let's mm-hmm. jump into it. Cuckoo is written and directed by Tillman Singer. It stars Hunter Schaefer, Dan Stevens, Jessica Henwick, Jan Bluthart, and others that come and go throughout the film, including little Mila Lou mm-hmm. as Alma. If you are not familiar with Cuckoo, it is about a 17-year-old girl who is forced to move with her family to a resort where things are not what they seem. That's a very accurate synopsis. Very accurate. (laughs) All right, Brendan, uh, what did you think about Cuckoo or Cocoa Puffs? (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Uh, I'm pretty Cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. Um... I'm not sure if I'm cuckoo for cuckoo though. <laughs> so Fair enough. when yeah. I when I jokingly said I think cuckoo for cocoa puffs is more interesting than this movie in particular, it's more so because I still really haven't decided if I'm on board with cuckoo or not yet. Admittedly, I don't really have many notes for this one because I want to see where this conversation goes. Okay. Uh, I, I will say I was perplexed, sometimes riveted sometimes baffled and sometimes really just puzzled by this thing and not in ways where I would normally see that as uh, as a compliment, especially for a first time director like this, because we often see first time horror directors in particular. Uh, and I believe this is Tillman Singer's first film, maybe second film. I haven't really done the the, the, the real research as as of uh, as as of yet, um, but they usually do some really ambitious swings as a filmmaker and try and do some really baffling things that are going to provoke an audience Uh, and 
I think this movie is trying to do that, especially narratively. It's a very narratively messy film. And in that way, it is very ambitious. And if it does get any points from me for originality, it really is in its high concept. I think the high concept is a pretty interesting one. And some of the um, the symbolism, some of its thematic ramifications that I'm sure we'll talk about, I think are pretty worthwhile ones it's interesting to almost see this as a strange trilogy closer with movies like immaculate and the first omen because it does have some uh tie-ins there thematically speaking that we can talk about i think the problem i have with it and i'll end my thoughts here before i transition back over to you is i'm just not sure if the film was tripping over its ambitious ambitions enough for me to find it interesting. Uh, I, I think it's one of those cases where it's more focused on its ambitious narrative, but not so much its ambitious direction or the portrayal of those ideas. Uh, mm. I, I think it's a film that could have been schlockier, could have leaned into its humor a bit more, leaned more into its absurdity. I feel like in execution, it is weirdly kind of passive. And I, mm. I don't know if that was the intent given this high concept because there are moments here that genuinely freaked me out a little bit. And then there are moments that genuinely made me laugh out loud quite quite vocally. And I'll, I'll talk about some of those examples as well. Okay. And I guess I wish the movie was maybe a bit more uh, uh, aware of those things and maybe try to attack those different tonal extremes a bit more. I, I This is a movie I wish was more tonally imbalanced if that makes sense because sure, uh, sure. i think that would have made it a more interesting one um but i think the execution feels a little bit timid for a movie that does yeah. have this kind of high concept and that's the thing that left me a little bit uh uncertain about it yeah i found myself in the same place as i did with maxine about a month ago where okay. i walked in very excited and walked out really wanting to like it more. I do okay. love what this film is aiming for as an exploration about grief and family and acceptance and the symbolism that comes with those ideas here regarding this circular nature of violence, breeding violence, I'll say mm -hmm. vaguely for now, I do think is very compelling. But unfortunately, the narrative gets too bogged down in the lore it creates to cipher that symbolism. By the okay, end of the yeah. film, you are able to make sense of everything, but trying to convey what's actually at play here, who's involved and to what extent, how does all this work, all of that creates a distraction that undermines the film's thematic and emotional impact, which is super frustrating because Singer, the director, and maybe this is where we differ a little bit. I, I do think okay. he does enough here to visually articulate its horror and how that emphasizes the film's themes. The close-ups on the throat and ears of these spirits, the disorientation these characters experience when they get caught up in the loop, the deadly mm -hmm. consequences that are exhibited when confronted by the spirits. All of that is enough without Koenig the Dan Stevens character here, her Koenig without him showing up to distill everything to the audience, like a bond villain. Maybe all you need is a brief sentiment on the connection that Alma has to these spirits. Again, I'll say as mm. vaguely as yeah. I can. That's really all you need in terms of exposition and explanation, or you fully lean into the lore and give even more world building oh, yeah. and context. Basically turn this into a Bond movie, as you said. Yeah. There, 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 there's a, there, again, we don't want to get into the specifics of what is revealed and what these motives are from certain characters, but it gets to a point where narratively it almost could fit in the realm of like a Roger Moore era Bond film <laughs> in some ways. It's, it's schlocky. It's weird. Yeah. It really is. And I think the film, as a result, is in a weird purgatory where yeah. it's not enough to erase its confounding narrative, but it's more than enough that you can't rely on ambiguity either. Mm -hmm. So it is somewhat stuck in the middle, and I did find that quite frustrating. That aside, though, I love the foreboding tone of the film and its eerie setting. Hunter Schaefer 
is excellent here. I didn't fully uh, find myself rooting against this film or being completely out of it. But every time I would inch my way back to the movie, it would do something to then rip me away from what I thought was was really compelling here. So yeah, uh, in the end, it doesn't quite reach the heights it's aiming for. And, but it, it's a film that I, I like what it's going for. I just I can't fully get with the movie. You know, you used a word in your opening thoughts there that I think best sums up my reaction to it, and that was purgatory. The movie is stuck in this kind of middle state, yeah. which is probably why the final product felt more timid and passive to me because it's so focused on all of these things. There's no time to focus on, you know, the schlockiness of its messy narrative or the more serious undertones in the way it explores familial grief, which is very common for horror movies like this nowadays. Um, But there is Mm -hmm. a potential for it to feel genuine because Hunter Schaefer is very compelling here. Um, And then, Mm -hmm. She's also very funny in other scenes. There's a moment where Dan Stevens' character comes over to their house with his lovely flute, I'll simply say, and offers the most bizarre explanation about Alma and her sickness. And she just Uh looks at him and her parents and goes, that's a weird effing way to put it. (laughs) It's it's one of the funniest (laughs) moments I've seen in any movie all year. And it's also weirdly emblematic of my problem with the film in totality because it's it's almost like my way of saying I wish the movie picked a lane, but I also yeah. wish it didn't pick a lane because I, I, I wanted to sense that messiness a little bit more. And I think it is here, but because it's trying to focus on so many things, every, every portion of that feels more, um, feels more minorly explored as opposed to extremely explored. And I think that's where the extreme nature of yeah. the story gets kind of lost as a result. So in totality, yeah. the film maybe feels a little bit more, passive than it really should even if that might not be the intent from tillman singer i think he is really trying to wring as much interest out of this material i just don't think he's focusing on the right thing simultaneously to do it all congruently i I completely agree and i don't know if it's born out of singer not trusting the audience or maybe he Mm -hmm. was getting notes from producers that hey this is too confounding we need to find a way to articulate what is going on here? What are the motives of yeah. Koenig? I don't really know, but yep. the film is very much stuck in purgatory. And I just don't think that it's necessary. I do think the symbolism of the film has connective tissue visually. I agree. Regarding these spirits, how they function, ultimately, how there is this circular effect to them. Now Mm -hmm. that is told to us, but I think if singer was to simply rely on visual storytelling, I think there's enough here already, but if you emphasize that and you want to add more visuals to convey that rather than dialogue, there's a version of this film that is even more robust in that regard. But still, I feel like I was able to connect to the symbolism and figure out the lore simply by the visuals here. Yeah, I think there's yeah. more than enough in that regard. So when yeah, Conan it's not a comes, complex movie in that regard. No, it, it's not. And I think it connects to the film's ideas on grief that we can get into as well. All of that on its own terms in a vacuum is compelling. But mm-hmm. when you couple it with the film overly explaining the plot, and how this world functions. And that dichotomy you noted of Gretchen completely aware and understanding that this Mm -hmm. circumstance is utterly bizarre, yet no one around them seems to connect in that same way. It's a little Midsommar in that regard. I I was just thinking of Midsommar because that's a (laughs) film that isn't as rely on its script to tell us things there's a lot of visual things happening there and that's a film that trips over its ambitions a lot but Ari Aster is doing something with that film visually that's also very compelling and interesting that that's where the film is at its most artistic and I feel like here Cuckoo it's more interested in 
the what as opposed to yeah. the why or the how and all of those things. Yeah. Midsommar, I think, is a great example of what this film is trying to do, but succeeds because it's way more reliant on its visuals yeah. than it is characters talking to the audience. Yeah. Uh, Dan Stevens, God love him. I think he's very good here. It is a great Bond villain audition. He it nails is. it. He's it very is. good uh, in what he's asked to do, but the character is overwritten. He gives the character a sinister quality that I think is effective but tonally, it is jarring when you compare it to Gretchen and the emotional ethos of that character, the horror of this film. Tonally, it is three different movies trying to act well, yeah. seamlessly. And yeah. you couple that with the messy narrative, and it's just a jarring experience going from one scene to the next. Do you think this would have been, would have been better specifically, this, to this story in particular, would it, have been, would it have been better if it didn't try to be a horror film? Like if this was just maybe like a sci-fi thriller or something like that. Yeah, maybe perhaps. like a 90s style yeah. sci-fi thriller. Maybe like it should have been more. Like a sci-fi thriller. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, in the, maybe in the vein of like a Paul Verhoeven kind of thing, like Total Recall or something like that. I think yeah. – uh, and, and uh, uh, trying to be careful here, I don't want to say this movie should have been something that we wanted as opposed to what it ended up being. But I think in a way the, the more horror-esque – uh, things that this movie is doing from a genre standpoint almost feels like a bit of a disservice for the weird yeah. narrative uh, uh, tricks it has up its up yeah. its sleeve. Uh, it, it almost feels like it's trying to play with a certain trend because these types of horror movies are still pretty popular right now. They're usually, I mean, after the success of Long Legs, Neon is going to try and bank on as many horror films as they can. And I don't think that was the case with this film in the sense that they probably had something else and thought, oh, retroactively, we need to turn this into a horror film now because Long Legs was yeah. such a success. There's no way they had that kind of time to recontextualize this movie in the same way that, let's say, Warner Brothers did with Suicide Squad back in 2016. Yeah. Um, but I do feel like this is a movie that's trying to be something that it doesn't need to be. Uh, and and maybe that's where that messiness also comes from because I I think the narrative yeah. it's telling is not a bad one I think there are some interesting things there not not just with regard to grief and family as you're talking about but motherhood in particular um impregnate impregnation or imp, imp, uh, whatever the word is uh, I keep I uh, but I'm uh, yeah. you know what I'm I'm kind of dancing right. around it a little yeah. bit um it, that's also part of this as well and. It has some interesting things up its sleeve. I just don't know if it handles it very well. No, I, I completely agree. I think on a thematic level, there is a lot here that I find uh, engrossing. Mm -hmm. When yeah. you look at Gretchen, who is suffering from grief, we find out in those opening scenes that her mother had just passed away. Yeah. She is trying to find closure. She finds comfort in leaving voice messages on her mom's answering machine where she can hear her voice that is a wonderful motif in this film it's very mm -hmm. evident that she does not have a relationship with her father they are very distant from each other yeah, he has very no different family he has now gretchen he treats her speaking of her father he treats her as if she's a burden so on one hand it is about grief and acceptance as Gretchen has to come to terms with where she's at now in her life, even if that means being with her father, who clearly isn't much of a parental figure to her. But it's mm -hmm. also about familial struggle and the circular nature of violence, thus creating a loop of generational conflict. At least that's what I think the film is suggesting through its symbolism of these spirits and the dichotomy of brood parasitism and the need yeah. for them to return that might say sound vague out of context once you see the film you'll understand what i mean there it's also indicative in both gretchen and alma half sisters both yeah. of whom are dropped into this family in their own distinctive ways mm -hmm. again i don't think it's seamless in execution but those ideas are affable it's simply uh, a matter of weaving all of this together. That's yeah. ultimately the problem here, right? Like in terms of, you know, like we've been joking a lot that 
the the film is called Cuckoo. There is a very specific reason that it is called Cuckoo again. Yeah, the which whole... is where I feel like the the motherly themes are a bit more direct and maybe whatever those motives could be. But yeah, it, it very much tells you what that symbolism is. Yes. And again, when you take a step back and you simply mm-hmm. look at the pieces that the film is moving into place, such as Greta or Greta, yeah. Gretchen and Alma being dropped into this family in a cuckoo type of way, mm-hmm. the dichotomy of these spirits, as I mentioned, brood parasitism, yeah. how they eventually come back into the fold. That is there. All you have to do is briefly connect uh, the the idea of cuckoo, the birds, that is, to the visuals that accompany that. And I mm-hmm. just feel like there's there's got to be a better way than sending in Bond villain to overly explain all of that and creating, to the audience. And creating a, a, an, an army, we'll simply say, that's yes. weirdly not too dissimilar from something like on her majesty's secret service <laughs> when you kind of think of the uh, uh the female army at play there I, it's it's almost visualized and formulated in a similar way uh, so you're right i think yeah. there could have been more of an opportunity for some visual storytelling to represent that symbolism yeah. without telling us those things and and i, I'm like, I, I and i don't i don't even mind the army aspect of it if you're going yeah. to completely lean into the well, schlock of it all. Like my issue isn't so much the manipulation of the spirits, you know, in the same way that like get out, for well, example, yeah, and how th- there's a similar manufacturing of spirits within human bodies. But mm-hmm. you look at the way Jordan Peele treats the horror of that film. And there is a grounded sensibility that gives weight to the horror and it doesn't feel like it's a schlocky yeah. exercise yeah. that is simply aiming for some sort of sci-fi entertainment. Well, you yeah. Know, like, my issue with this film isn't so much that Koenig is manipulating in a similar way. It's that he comes out and goes, Okay, Mrs. Bond, this <laughs> is my plan, stroke the cat. And well, I it's, am it's going to finally get you. It's the stroke execution the cat. of that, and and no, you're absolutely right. Um, and it, it's it's the execution of that because there could have been more of an artistic way of trying to convey that. And I'm with you. I don't mind the uh, the quote unquote female army that's represented here too because I, I don't know if this was the intent from Tillman Singer as a storyteller, but it does feel like the film is also going for a bit of a sociopolitical message as it relates to well, womanhood, motherhood, fertilization or impregnation was the word I was trying to say earlier. Uh, yeah. And there's even a line later on in the film when there's this back and forth between two particular characters, one of them being Dan Stevens's character, where he says regarding one of the younger females here, she was born to be a mother. And the idea of that choice then being ripped away from someone. So there, it's probably going for some similar things like that, which I think are affable notions. I, I just wonder about the execution and the connectivity as we keep talking yeah. about and trying to uh, seamlessly portray uh, whatever that mission statement is. And I just yeah. don't well, know if that's and successful that comes, there. That comes back to our opening thoughts on the film and it's purgatory. Because mm-hmm. I don't think there is enough here, logically, if we're simply looking at it narratively and in terms of world building, to make sense of all of that. Yeah. When you look at motherhood and how it connects to these children and you know the army that he's trying to create and his motives mm-hmm. and all of that, yeah. it is very messy. I, I, don't, I don't think there's much cogency to it. It feels half baked. So commit to that. Give us more. Like if if you're if you're gonna do it, I'd rather it feel like a Bond movie where we're just given tons of exposition. That would have been so interesting, honestly. Like, I like, like, like a genre yeah. film like that with this story. You know, kind of going back to my comparison to Paul Verhoeven, a movie like 
Total Recall or RoboCop or something like that that is so high concept yeah. and literal but actually is taking some bold thematic swings I, I think would have been a yeah. really interesting way I, to go I, about I think, it. I think you have to lean into it or remove it and rely on the visuals because I think the visuals do enough of the heavy lifting that at least symbolically well, I can connect to the idea of this mother wanting to get her child back yeah. and well the performances how, do enough that of it would, too and why that or how that would connect to Gretchen on yeah. an emotional level yeah. yeah so you know like but going back to what you're saying in terms of the impregnation uh mm -hmm. aspect of this film that is not something that is really explored those ideas are mm -hmm. here it's but superficially not visualized realized. Yeah. yeah it's it's very superficial it's just so, it, it, it's easy to latch on to them because it's such a top of mind topic politically yeah. right now well, I, so it's I, easy to really i guess latch on to that as maybe having more importance yeah. here but i do agree that it does also weirdly feel inconsequential in the way yeah. it's uh, in the way it's utilized yes. here it, it very much is and uh that's why i think at least my interpretation of the film really leans more into the circular nature of this film and what that means as far as generational conflict, because you can draw lines between Gretchen and her mom and her father and now stepmother and sister, and you can sense the conflict and how that trickles down. Like there is well, that effect. And then it circles yeah. back to this spirit who becomes involved at the end of the film with this specific family. So yeah. that idea, especially when you connect it through the parasitism that is explained earlier in the film, I, I, I think that makes sense. I think the visuals are there, but it's, again, you can't rely on, ambigu on ambiguity because they there's too much lore here, but it's also not enough. So the film is stuck and mm -hmm. you know it backs itself into a corner and there's no way out. And in terms of some of the action and, how it unfolds again in a vacuum. There are moments that I'm really compelled by. Like I love, love that moment between uh, Alma and Gretchen. They're at the end. They are in that broom. I was just going to reference yes. that it, because it's not just the visual storytelling here. That's doing a lot of that work that was already there for us. It's, it's the performances the that performances. are also doing that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Schaefer is fantastic. When she is explaining to Alma why she's, heartbroken at the end of this film it is stunning it's it is stunning very, it's very very moving it's good but it's also weirdly too good given how literal the script <laughs> is it's almost like it's uh, the, yeah. the worst thing i can say about any filmmaker regardless if they're um if they're a new filmmaker or if they're an experienced one is is if it feels like their craft as a storyteller whether it be in the writing or the direction if it feels like they don't trust their actor to do the work they need then that feels like a problem yeah. And yeah. this film doesn't feel like it trusts Hunter Schaefer. And that's a problem yeah. in a way. Well, and again, this circles back to Singer's direction. As much as I appreciate some of the visual flair here, mm -hmm. in terms of tone management, I think that is one of his biggest weaknesses, not just in terms of the schlock and the horror and the emotion and his inability to manage all of that here, but that also trickles into the performances because Schaefer and Stevens are in completely different movies. Mm -hmm. They're not yeah. on the same plane at all. Stevens, of course, is leaning into the schlock and yeah. Schaefer is really great in terms of this trying to be, um, I don't know, like a hereditary or something that is emotionally like horror, horror but emotionally rooted. She's really great at embodying sure. that in this film. And, you know, we talked about that moment with Greg, uh, Gretchen and Alma, but I also think mm -hmm. of the moment when her dad tells her that he has sold the house. Yeah. She is devastated. Absolutely yeah. heartbroken. And you get that montage there in the aftermath of her listening back and she's completely succumbing to her grief in that moment. Like she's just mm -hmm. fan. Mm -hmm freaking tastic at tapping into that emotional ethos in the character that does not however gel very well 
with I'm here to get you, Mrs. Bond. Which like, okay, so uh, you're you're not wrong. Yet at the same time, if I go back to my opening thoughts, I, I I mentioned how I felt like I wished the film was even more tonally imbalanced because that would have at least made it seem more interesting to me. Because as as imbalanced as that is, it's not something I even sensed all that much in the moment. It, it we and I guess because of that maybe purgatory, go further with that disparity. Well, I don't, maybe, maybe yeah, right. maybe it needed yeah. to because that purgatory like state weirdly creates this this almost static sensibility even when the film is leaning into two completely different genre avenues if you will yeah. I, I had a hard time sensing those shifts because of that passivity in where it's sitting you know you know and yeah. I, I, I I love I, I I'm with you that the 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 genuine heartbreak that Hunter Schaefer's performance is evoking combined with Dan Stevens's bond villain like performance, that is something that should not work. No, and yet no, I, I kind of wish that Tillman Singer kind of capitalized on the fact that it should not work a little bit. Well, more. and I think that's where the hurt or the writing, excuse me, and its messiness hurts yeah. Stevens. Yeah. Because Schaefer is pretty consistent at tapping into those grounded sensibilities. You yeah. know, we're talking about the poignancy of our character, but I also think of the moment when she's riding her bike home after working mm -hmm. the night shift. Yeah. And as she's writing, we get these insert shots of something running alongside her or after her. And yeah. with each cut, the sequence builds with this incredible tension that starts to crescendo and it crystallizes yeah. with this great effect. And it leads to her going to the hospital where she ends up having a head injury, which is where she gets the wrap. If you've seen any imagery of this film, you'll see her with, the head wrap on there. Yeah. Yeah. And all like all of that, I think is great in her performance as well. Like tapping into that urgency, tapping into mm -hmm. that fear, or even, you know, you, you noted how funny it was earlier because yeah. in contrast to Stevens, who is certainly more outlandish, it, it does come off funny, but her reaction to, Hey, this situation is nonsense. This is crazy. Again, yeah. that comes from a grounded place. So yeah. that and her performance, uh, like I think, is really great. Dan Stevens, mm -hmm. though, is the one character who is, I assume, he's told to be a little bit more bombastic. Let's get over he's the top a, here. Let, let's be hammy. Let's be a little hammy, and he is. But the writing is asking for that at the same time. Mm -hmm. So is that Stevens or is that the writing and direction. I, I tend to lean more toward the latter there. Uh, Perhaps, maybe. But I don't know. It could be a combination. Either way, it it makes for, to something you said earlier, a, a baffling experience at times. What did you think of the horror of this movie when it's functioning well, as a quote-unquote horror it, film? Again, I think that's where I, I get frustrated because I do like what it is aiming for. I always go mm -hmm. back to that. I love what this film is aiming for emotionally, thematically in terms of the horror and its aesthetics, like the way Singer captures these loops that these characters get caught in mm -hmm. or that moment of uh, Gretchen riding down the street on her bike. That is a really yeah. great moment of tension and horror in this film that I think is great. Like the aesthetic of the spirit that is after her. I love all of that as well. Um, yeah. So, like, I think when it's acting as a grounded horror film, there is a lot to like here. When mm -hmm. it becomes a little bit more schlocky, maybe not as much. Uh, mm -hmm. And okay. I think, again, that's where the tones feel a little a little imbalanced in a way that, that doesn't really service yeah. the film. But, I, I, again... I, when it acting as a horror film, I think it's good. I just wish it leaned more I, into that, I guess. I, I Yeah, I think the horror sequences in a vacuum are fairly effective. Uh, I was a little bit confused by the visualization of this quote-unquote woman that is basically the subject of this monstrous figure that's hyped up here. Uh, yeah. Primarily because with, and, and I don't know if it's too much of a spoiler to give at least a few descriptions here, but 
the goggled red eyes are very yeah. crucial to the visualization of this character. <laughs> Remember that movie Brightburn from some years ago? Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I was weirdly reminded I never of did that. See it, but yeah, it's not horrible. It's not great. It's <laughs> I, I skipped it. <laughs> just like, uh, I feel like, isn't that like the greatest review you can give to any movie? It's not horrible, it's, uh, but it's yeah. not great. It's whatever. <laughs> it's, yeah. Which I feel like is the worst thing to say, about a movie that has a pretty high concept. So maybe the movie actually yeah. kind of sucks. Um, but I, I, I was weirdly reminded of that. Uh, and, and I, there, there's a goofiness to the way that this quote unquote creature is depicted that, Again, it goes back to some of my opening thoughts. I wish it sort of leaned into the silliness a bit more because it had an opportunity to emphasize a little bit of personality there. And I think that purgatory, once again, the best way I can put it is that it it doesn't amplify the personality where it needs to. So it feels a little bit uninterested in where it could get interesting. Uh, and I think that's another example of it. So I thought the horror sequences were pretty effective in a vacuum, but... They also left me wanting a little bit more intrigue, a little bit more playfulness, if that makes sense. Sure. Uh, and okay. I'm not sure if it quite got there, just given all the things surrounding the movie that kind of, you know, that, that kept handcuffing it as we keep talking about. Yeah, I, I think that's fair. I I enjoyed it enough, especially given the story that it was trying to tell. And it's trying to balance something that is emotional at its core with something that is broad in terms of its mm -hmm. scale, I guess, in, in terms yeah. of the story and the mythology that it's introducing here. Mm -hmm. um, I, I found it all interesting in, in a vacuum. I just don't okay. think there's enough to make sense of it gotcha. um, in the end. Yeah, uh, yeah. Like I'm, it, I'm more or less with again, you in like, some ways. I, I, I just I go back to I feel like I'm stuck in a loop now. Like I just go back to <laughs> give us more or give us less. Like lean into ambiguity. I wanted to like more this mythology. more. I wanted to like this a lot yeah. more. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I don't know if I have anything else to add. I mean, that's kind of where I'm at with this movie. Yeah, I like the musicality here. I, Actually, I there is I, one other thing that we can talk about. Sorry, okay. we can certainly get back to the musicality. Well, no, I just wanted to. I just wanted to reference it. I didn't really have many thoughts on it, but I thought gotcha. the musicality here was good. Okay. The Henry character is a big part of this as well. And mm -hmm. that's a character that I similarly find myself frustrated because I don't know if the film fully realizes his motives because throughout a lot of the film, he is a partner to Gretchen. Oh, he I am is here to help you. Okay. Do you remember... Indiana Jones in the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, Ray Winston's yeah. character and how he kept going back and forth. That's what Henry is in yes. this movie. <laughs> yeah. Like he is here to help Gretchen. Then there's a reveal later on at the film or later on in the film that to your point feels like a contrivance because we need mm -hmm. to get to that excuse me, we need to get to that moment where yeah. it's about Gretchen and Alma and their yeah. connection. Well, yeah. we can't have Henry be a part of that. He has to find himself distance from Gretchen. So what mm -hmm. do we do? And it makes sense enough on paper, yeah. but it also feels a little bit like, okay, come on. Yeah. That's yeah. that's it feels it just you can see the seams. Like you can see the film manufacturing something to get him out of the ending that's of this the thing film. yeah there's potential intrigue for that character if yeah. the, if the if the machinations of the plot weren't there and so on the nose so and obvious, obvious. Yeah, yeah absolutely yeah uh, but, but yeah issue. if the performance could have easily added some layers to the character without the plot turning those wheels for him yeah and that's ultimately ultimately my issue with the character and, and, yeah. and but up until the ending i thought it was a like because there's also a sense of mystery is he honest or isn't he like we don't fully trust sure. him but his actions are consistent and yes i'm here to help you until all of a sudden that rug is pulled and it feels like an unearned gotcha moment yeah yeah me, yeah i still i haven't wrapped my head around it just yet but i i, I was distracted by the mechanics as you're talking about which yeah. is not what i wanted in a moment like um, that same thing with the Ed character, completely underutilized. Don't know why she's here. 
Oh gosh, um, yeah. Oh yeah. You know, comes in, makes one scene again. It, it's the contrivance of it. It's mm-hmm. you know, let's let's get out of here. Yeah, like we need we need a way for you to try to escape. So they force that in only for. We need to have to a car crash scene. Yes, because we got to get butts in seats. <laughs> okay, <laughs> and then she disappears from the whole movie until the final scene. Kind and of hilarious, like, honestly. Okay, there she is. She's back. Could have been. Like, it could have been funny if the movie was more self-aware of that, but it's not. Yeah, so, but it's not. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I just I don't know if there's more that is on the cutting room floor. That's always possible. Yeah, I I don't, I don't know. know. I feel it's I feel weird. like this conversation is making me sound more cynical than I'm intending to because I really wanted yeah. to like this movie. There are things about it that are very intriguing, and I actually do like the story it's telling. I just don't. I I, yeah. I I'm left so frustrated by the uh by the entire experience, yeah. honestly. Absolutely. I mean, I I feel like we've had this conversation a couple times recently. Like with Cuckoo, it is it is an execution problem. I love yeah. a lot of what's here on paper. And even in the context of the film, there's a lot that's good. Yeah. But it, it, the execution of its tones, its themes, its action, its horror, it just leaves you frustrated with the yeah. way, it, its inability to balance it all. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm with you. I, I don't, I, I don't think it's one of the better horror stuff. films of the year. I, I agree. I agree. Unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, any final thoughts? I think we've exhausted. I no, I feel. I feel like. I, I feel like we're at a point now. If we keep talking about the film, we're just going to find new ways of saying everything we just said. It's yeah. we're we're, we're going to keep paraphrasing ourselves. I I, I just I yeah, want to stuck like in a loop. More, really yeah, we're, yeah, we're stuck in a loop. So I we're guess stuck, we can go ahead and we're stuck end in a cuckoo. There. We're stuck in a cuckoo. Uh, donuts. Let's talk about that again. No, oh gosh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, now uh, I'm hungry. We can't talk about this this late. I'm not going to get any sleep tonight. <laughs> if you agree or disagree, and some of you might disagree, that's perfectly fine. Leave a comment below. If you're watching on YouTube, reach out to us on social media: Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, or you can email us in sessionfilm at gmail dot com. Uh, quickly, just want to say, be on the lookout for our other review this week. We talk about. The Sean Wang film Didi, uh, episode 597 is up and available as well, mm-hmm. where we talk about reevaluating movies, our favorite movies that have been reevaluated over uh, over the years, in particular yeah. recent times. Uh, so that was a lot of fun. You can go check that out. If we give some thoughts on D23 as well. Yep, it was it was a great show. So. Go and check that out. Be on the lookout for our 2000 retrospective that is coming up in two weeks' time. Indeed. Indeed. Soon. Be ready. We'll have best of the decade on episode 600. Mm -hmm. I can't wait for that either. So that was a great time to join us. Subscribe. Be around. Um, We got important things. Got lots of homework to still do, man. Exactly. We're having a we're having a fun time. We hope that you join us. So uh, yeah, we're busy. Uh, we're busy. We still have new films to watch. We have two thousands films to watch, and then we have to finalize this best of the decade thing once again. And yeah. yet, during this week, we're leading up to the weekend of Alien Romulus. I just want to rewatch the Alien franchise again. It's like, but I, I can't know. prioritize that. I just, it's just not too right. much happening. Yeah. I probably won't get to the Alien films as much as I want to. It just it comes. It came out at the wrong time of the year for me. <laughs> I I <laughs> will say, JD, I I am really intrigued. If you do decide to give Alien Covenant specifically a, re- a rewatch sometime soon, I want to see okay. if anything changes for you. But I don't think it will. But I would love to see something shift for you. Okay. <laughs> we'll see. Maybe it will. I'm gonna go in open minded. As it stands now, its nihilism is very hollow for me. But we'll see. We'll see. Who knows? Maybe yeah. I'll change my tune and I'll have to delete a lot of tweets. So <laughs> we'll I actually thought you goes. went back and rewatched Prometheus and Alien Covenant last night or something because you posted yeah. that tweet earlier today. It's like, okay, no. have, have you finally solidified your thoughts on those two films? No, just our conversation on the main show inspired mm-hmm. that. But yeah, we'll see. I, I, I do hope to catch up with it. There's just so much homework to do right now. There is. You know, we'll there see is. how it goes. Um, I will we'll say uh, in preparation for Alien Romulus, the early buzz for it, the early reactions are looking pretty divisive, which yes. now means I'm finally excited for it. <laughs> there you go. 
I wasn't no, for a while, and then all of a sudden I started seeing mixed responses in a way that's like, okay, maybe maybe this does have some tricks I, up its I will, sleeve. The thing that makes me curious about it is that the people that totally went for Covenant are not liking the movie. And so it, it makes me curious as to where I'm going to land on it being yeah. on the other side of that coin. I know, I know. Uh, and I'm seeing people who... I, I heard someone say that if you think Alien and Aliens are the only good Alien movies, then you'll love Alien Romulus. I just, I don't know. I just, yeah. I don't know. We'll see. Because I, obviously I do, but I, I love Aliens 3. I'm sort of in that camp, sort of not. I don't well, know. Well, and don't then know. I saw someone else say it's, it, it, you'll like it if you love Ghostbusters Afterlife, which is like, okay, that might be a problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I've while I've been intrigued by the trailers of Romulus, you know, I've what I've liked is what I like about Ridley Scott and you know what his, uh, you know his you know what he's done with this franchise and it's the craft. Like the craft yeah. looks really great, but I've always been reserved that Romulus was going to lean too heavily into nostalgia. You know, like, because mm. I do feel like the trailers feel like it is pandering big time. Yeah. And I don't, and I don't know if that's going to be. It a looks like it's recreating. It looks like it's recreating shots from that first alien film. Yes. And, and that's where I'm like, I, I'm a little bit dubious, but if it mm -hmm. does it in a force awakens kind of way, that's subversive and interesting and mm -hmm. antithetical, then Okay, I'll I'll be on board if that's what it actually yeah. is. But I I can't I can't fully tell from the yeah. trailers or, or the divisive reactions. Yeah, will it just yeah. be a horror movie in space? I don't know. Yeah, um, we'll see. We'll see. At any rate, with all of that said, thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on the Incession Film Podcast. I'm Cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs and John's Donut. I like Donut. Happy Mixer. Shout out to them as well.